Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, really warm welcome to you, um, which I say every week, and I mean it. I'm always very, uh, very pleased to see all of you uh, who decide to come in and listen to our Trisha talks. We've got a lovely guest today, um, somebody whose name was familiar to me when I, um, when it first came into my consciousness, uh, that she was also a customer of Look Fabulous Forever. But her name is Divna Flynn. But I'd heard it on the radio, um, and I, I heard it mentioned at the end particularly of the um, book club program which is on radio four so it was a name as i said that was familiar to to me but uh, as different and i were just chatting she is actually a customer of look fabulous forever and has been for some time um, and came to us at wimbledon for a makeover before her daughter's graduation which is uh, which is rather lovely anyway this afternoon we're going to have a good old chat about um really about her life in, in in books from the point of view of somebody who's very passionate i would say about books very knowledgeable about books my goodness me um i think there's an awful lot that she knows so much so that she has ch been chosen this year uh, very prestigiously to be a judge for the costa book awards and uh, i want to talk um to find out all about that because uh, i think that would be the most fascinating thing to do and uh, I, I should look forward to hearing what that entails so so Dip, i'm going to start with a very simple question which is really all about how you got into radio in the first place and then how your career developed to the point where I think for 20 years you were uh, a producer on the book club uh, program book club with uh, Jim Nocti so uh, tell us about it well thanks Tricia um yeah I joined the BBC in 1986 just to say I just left uh, in January uh, I took retirement in January of this year but so I joined 35 years before as a secretary, um, pretty much after university, a gap of a couple of years. I had a degree in French and Italian, didn't really know what I wanted to do, um, but knew that I loved listening to the radio and listening to the World Service. So I joined the World Service as a secretary. And after um, a couple of years working there, where I realised that I was never really going to be able to use my languages because um, French and Italian weren't really the big languages of the World Service, I applied um, to work in programme making on Radio 4. And I won't bore you with all the details, but um, I kind of made my way up the ladder via various internal trainee schemes until I became uh, a trainee producer on New and Yours, if anyone knows that's that's a consumer program, and then a producer on Loose Ends. And four years after joining the BBC, I was a producer and I stayed as a producer <laughs> for the next uh, 30 years. Um, and how I made it into books after working on these different programmes, um, so I was working on uh, a programme called Loose Ends, which is the entertainment programme that goes out on Saturday evenings now. And um, just one of those things that happens to us all, I think, in our working life, a little bit of chance. Um, Loose Ends was off air for a couple of weeks and I was sitting in the office planning and a manager walked by and saw me and they were looking for a producer to step in on Desert Island Discs and produce Isabel Allende, the South American writer who wrote House of the Spirits, to produce her Desert Island Discs. And he said, do you know who she is? And I said, I have read all her books because I've always been a reader. My degree in languages very much was literature based. And he just looked at me at a different light when I said, I've read all her books. He saw me as someone who knew about books and not long after that, I was um, put on to Open Book, the books magazine programme. And then when my second child was born, I went to Book Club. Book Club goes out once a month and um, I worked two days a week for quite a long time whilst I was bringing up my children, which is why I was there for 20 years, really. Um, so book club was obviously a massive part of your life for a very long time and as you say it goes out once a month so for those people watching who may or may not have uh, have listened to book club tell it tell us what the program is and what was your role within it well it's it's now been going for 21 years it started in may 1998 
Um, and it was kind of one of, it was a reaction to all the book clubs that were springing up uh, around the country, around the world. I think we'd already had the Oprah Winfrey book club in America, but there weren't any book clubs in the media at that time. So a colleague of mine now since long retired came up with the idea with Jim Nocte, who's although very well known for the Today programme, has um, a degree in English literature and is absolutely passionate about books. And in fact, I mean, he loves classic literature, but he also loves crime and thrillers and has since written a couple of spy thrillers himself. They came up with the idea of having the Nation's Book Club, where they would talk to a leading author. Uh, it was recorded, but every Sunday, it would go out every Sunday afternoon on the first calendar Sunday of the month. And we would flag up the idea of this author coming on. So um, Radio 4 listeners would know the book ahead and be able to read along. And we recruited uh, listeners to come into the studio, about 20 listeners who would all read the book in advance and send in quest questions. And we would, in a very kind of gentle, informal way, pinpoint them to what questions we wanted to hear. But it was very conversational and informal. It's not like any questions or Gardner's question time, which is quite rigid in its format, very much a dialogue and conversation between the author and Jim and the group of readers in the audience. Um, and uh, the very first programme was with an author called Sebastian Folks on his book, Birdsong. I didn't produce that. That was, uh, you know, a few years before I came on board. But um, uh, yeah, and actually in those days there was money for a pilot and they did, they recorded the first programme as a pilot and it was all a little bit kind of wooden and tricky. And they realised, I, I don't think I'm taking out, talking out of turn by saying this, but they realised that if they served a glass of wine <laughs> in the studio to the audience members before we started the recording, that everyone kind of relaxed a little bit into it because obviously people were a little bit unsure of meeting Jim and an author who they really liked um, and then gradually you know the program just kind of built and built on itself and had a fantastic it does have a really fantastic reputation in the books world and you know when I left we'd done kind of 230 authors or something it's uh, yeah. And in fact, one of the reasons I was quite happy to go was I felt that I had met every author <laughs> and, you know. Wow, what, what, a, what a privilege, uh, incredible privilege. And you mentioned Sebastian Folks and uh, Birdsong, which was probably one of the best books I've ever read, um, just to evoke the horror of the trenches in the First World War, which he did so absolutely brilliantly. And uh, as you say, it's a lovely concept really, isn't it? It's inclusive, it's, um, it makes reading accessible to everyone. And of course, it puts the author, it gives you the opportunity to hear what the author's thoughts were about various aspects of, um, you know, of a book. I can, one that I remember, which is a bit, bit bizarre, but um, Lynn Reed Banks. Yeah. Um, yes, I produced that. That, that was a really <laughs> interesting programme. Yeah. Well, the, th the thing about that book, I, was, the, was her book, her book was something about a room or single? It was called The L-Shaped Room. Oh, that's right. And it was a massive kind of hit in the 60s, a kind the of 60s, modern classic. Which is when I read it. So I was a college student in the 60s and The L-Shaped Room was about um, a, a girl becoming pregnant and having an illegitimate child. And then um, she lives in the most appalling accommodation with bed bugs and God knows what. That's what the L-shaped room is. The L-shaped room is, is the place that she ends up. And um, I, and I was absolutely amazed that you'd got, you'd, you'd sort of delved back into that archive in a way of that story. But I absolutely loved that program because I just thought it was so interesting. That is so nice to hear. Um, it was kind of one of those ones where you think, who are the great authors that we haven't done? What have been the big books that have almost been like game changers? And although, you know, I'm just turned 60 um, 
just in April. So I kind of didn't read it as a young woman like you when it came out, but I was very much aware of it. And of course, she also writes children's books. And I was just very much aware of that being a seminal book and it would be great to have it in our archive. And I mean, I don't know if you remember from the programme, but um, very interesting going back to a book, talking about it in the late 1990s or early 2000s, maybe. She was quite elderly, she was on great form, but yeah. she was quite, quite elderly. And she was quite reluctant, I think, when I invited her to come on, if I remember rightly, because the book has dated. Mm. And one of the ways that it has dated, um, and I'm sure we must have talked about this in the programme, is in its portrayal, in her portrayal as the author of the young woman's black neighbour who lives next door. And there were things that just were in the book that just would not be acceptable today. I mean, they weren't really acceptable back then. <laughs> um, and, you know, because attitudes change it, and um, that was very interesting to talk to her about that. I can't really remember what she said, but I'm sure, you know, she was a bit reluctant to come on and talk about it, but I think she kind of said, I wouldn't do that now. Yeah. Yeah, which is fair enough. I mean, you know, things have to be, to a certain extent, reflect the time in which they're written and so on and so forth. Um, I actually, uh, you know, one of the questions I want to ask you, I, that, that just popped into my head as a memory for me of, of the book club. I mean, I listen to it a lot, but, you know, you were working on it for a long time. Um, stand out people, stand out moments, stand out books, you know, I mean, of all of those, as you say, you got to, you must have got to meet some of your heroes and heroines. So, so which one? would really stick in your mind well they're all so different it's so interesting every author was so different um ah it's a, actually you know it should be an easy question for me to answer and it's just not um i suppose hillary mantel doing hillary mantel on bring up the bodies down at the Budley Salterton Literary Festival. She lives down in Budley Salterton and there's a very small literary festival there, which she plays quite a big part in, you can imagine. And, um, you know, she'd won the Booker twice at that point and everybody wanted, you know, to get interviews with her and she was doing less and less interviews because it was stopping her writing The Mirror and the Light, the final volume that we were all waiting for for so long. Um, and it was just, um, it was just so great to meet her and to talk to her um, at such close quarters about the book. And one of the reasons that it stood out, I mean, one thing that I really, really liked doing on Book Club was going um, to smaller literary festivals and supporting them for, to take a Radio 4 programme and to support a small festival. So for example, Derby Books Festival, they contacted us on the off chance. It was um, set up by two women, uh, Sean and, I'm not going to be able to remember, remember the second one's name, I'm afraid. Um, they, as a kind of project in their early retirement, they loved books, they loved festivals. They thought they'd set one up in Derby. And they just sent an email in to book club saying, we love the programme, any chance you'd come? And I just said, yeah, we're going to come. We're going to come to Derby Books Festival. And then that opened so many doors to them because I'll be, I'll be frank, big literary festivals like Hay and Edinburgh, Cheltenham, they actually don't really need the presence of, of a publicly funded programme to kind of come and support them. But it absolutely changed Derby's fortunes us going to them. Anyhow, back to Hilary Mantel. One of the reasons that um, it really stood out to me was the moment, and I used it in clips about that program um, afterwards many times. She talked about going to, there's a National Trust House in Hackney, which I actually used to live around the corner to. Um, and it's a Tudor house, it's extraordinary, in Clapton, in Hackney. And she went there to do some uh, research and she saw in some brickwork, she saw 
an animal's footprint in some brickwork in the same way that we might walk down the road and there might be a new paving stone or there might be some cement and an animal's walked into it and there's a paw print. And she was taken, so taken by the fact that an animal had walked across this brickwork in Tudor times. And, you know, she gave that as an example of her inspiration and her research in the programme. The other reason that that programme stands out for me was there was a terrible humming on uh, the recording, which um, as it was going through, we recorded in a school, we recorded in a staff room in a school, which was being uh, a venue being used by the festival. And there was a terrible humming, which I could hear in my headphones. And um, I was trying to signal to the sound engineer to see if he could hear it. And he was going, giving me the thumbs up, which I thought it all meant it was fine. And when I took it back to London, it really wasn't fine. And it caused me such anxiety. And I had to sit with a sound engineer in the studio in London whilst he went through EQing levels, all kinds of magical things on a huge BBC desk and he got rid of all that hiss and that co that caused me so much anxiety I thought I thought I've recorded with Hilary Mantel and am I going to be able to, to broadcast it it was you know I lost a night's sleep over that and uh, I bought um, Giles the sound engineer a very nice bottle of red wine to say thank you <laughs> I can imagine. Wow. Um, I can also imagine that Hilary Mantel would make a fantastic interviewee because she's an incredibly intelligent and uh, articulate woman who has a lot to say about a lot. In a, in a, you know, she has a lot of interesting things to say. And I absolutely loved uh, that, uh, you know, well, that particular one, Bring Up the Bodies, I thought was the best of the three that she wrote. Uh, just sort of stunning book. Um, and and Tricia, to have Hilary Mantel in a room with... 20 readers in a, it was an oak panelled staff room uh, in a really lovely school just outside Budley Salterdon just 20 people mm. uh, they loved it you know they were open jawed really um, yeah and it was great yeah that would be a very memorable indeed um, so uh, tell us a bit more <coughs> about being a judge on the Costa Book Award. That's a, that's a very um, big accolade for you. You must have been thrilled when they approached uh, approached you. Yes, I, um, I was really, really pleased. Um, when I left the BBC, um, it's quite something to leave somewhere like that after 35 years. You get quite institutionalised and the BBC, it becomes very much part of your identity. Um, and, you know, I had a name in the books world. I mean, you know, it's an unusual name. It's an, it's an Irish name for anyone that uh, is interested. But as you said, it's a name that people kind of remember. And um, I just didn't want to go to one of my friends said it must be like leaving BBC must be like leaving. Going from hero to zero, one of my friends said, <laughs> and I, yeah, I know, but it's kind of just that thought of, of leaving somewhere and your friends and your colleagues and that routine. And I just thought, I really want to keep my um, foot in the books world. I want to keep connected. And so I'm not really, a, I don't think of myself as a networker at all. Um, but um, as I was leaving, I just kind of phoned all my main contacts. And one of them was the Costa, because um, as well as working on Book Club, I also worked on Front Row on the Daily Live Arts Programme. And I ran their books brief for two days a week. So I was booking authors and I was doing a lot of work with the prizes. And I, when I told, so I called the Costa to phone them, you know, to tell them I'm leaving and I was no longer their contact. And I said, listen, you know, if you've ever got any opportunities, you know, I'm, you know, going to be kind of keeping my hand in the books world, you know, please bear me in mind. So, yes, I was absolutely thrilled um, to get the invite. So I'm a, I'd, would you like me to explain how the Costa Book Awards work? Absolutely, yes. Because um, I don't know, but um, there are five categories of book awards. Um, there's first novel, novel, children's, biography and poetry. And in January, uh, the 
five individual winners will be announced. They're announced every January. Um, so there's a judge and then out of those five winners, an overall Costa Book Award winner is um, chosen. So in the early stages of the awards, um, I've been chosen to be a judge on the first novel award, uh, along with two other judges. So I'm, I won't name them because I'm not, it's not quite out, I can say that I'm a judge, I'm not sure whether they're actually saying they're judges, but um, so I'm kind of under the heading of books journalist. And then there's a bookseller, uh, which is literally somebody who works in a bookshop. They really get people from the shop floor who know what sells, what people are buying. And then there's an author as well. So the three of us will be receiving submissions of uh, about 90, wow. 90 books, which we will divide up between us, or rather Costa are dividing up between us. Um, it might be 100. What's 35 times three? My maths is absolutely hopeless. <laughs> what, what, what did you ask 35 times three? Yeah, my maths is hopeless. 100 105. There'll be about, there's 105 books and we're each reading 35. And uh, from those, we will meet and discuss, and we are able to read choices, books from the other people. If, if I fancy something that one of the other judges is reading, uh, to kind of check that out, I can call it in. Um, and then in September, we will get together and we will choose a shortlist. So you're in the category of first novels. So yes. these people that have no track record, so they'll be complete strangers to you. Uh, they will be, apart from the fact that um, I've known I'm going to be a judge since February, so I've been keeping my eye out in my reading and as books have been published. Um, and also just because there are books that are quite buzzy out there, because I'm always, you know, I read the bookseller, um, I'm always looking on uh, bo books on Bookstagram, you know, Instagram. There's a part of Instagram called Bookstagram. It's basically a kind of a hashtag where people write book reviews. And since I left the BBC, I've been writing book reviews on Instagram, giving my recommendations. And so I'm keeping an eye out there for new books that are kind of coming through. Um, but yeah, in, in theory, these are all new names. And previously, some really, um, I think one of the best known first novels that has come through that people might remember is Elephant, Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine. Yeah. So that was a very successful Costa First Book Award. And actually, in a way, when I'm thinking about the reading, I've been sent eight books so far. Um, that's kind of my touchstone. The criteria is to read a book, to choose a book as a winner that you will thrust into your friend's hands and say, this is a great read. You will really, really enjoy it. So, you know, that's the ethos of the Costa is enjoyable. It's not kind of clever, clever, you might think, or political perhaps like the Booker can sometimes be. Um, you know, I, I think of the Booker as being very highbrow, very literary. Um, so, the, you know, the Costa has a kind of, it's a very broad reach. Yeah. Uh, and is it British novels or is it? Yes, Brit Britain and Ireland. Britain and Ireland. Um, okay. Uh, and is it, is it female only? No. No. So it's no. a broad yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The, that used to be the Orange Book, Orange Prize. Book. Yes, uh, which is uh, now the Women's okay. Prize for Fiction. Yeah. Um, we're almost at the end of, the, of our conversation, but I really wanted to, um, to pick your brain, as we've got you here, about um, your current favourites. You know, what, what are you, what in the last few months have you read that's really stood out for you? Well, actually there is, there is a book and um, I came across it in exactly the same way that I'm sure lots of other people come across books. Um, I'd actually never heard of this author. She's called Catherine Heine. 
and she's American and um, Indian Knight wrote a review of this book in um, the Sunday Times a couple of months ago and it's called Early Morning Riser and in it Indian Knight said something like this book made me feel good to be alive and so it was kind of we were coming out of you know that lockdown in April May and then I went on Twitter and I saw about people talking about it on Twitter and people saying this sounds great and then um, I had a look it's not her first novel she's as like I said she's American uh, there's the previous book called Standard Deviation oh, and just, then I, you've I've just read it Standard Deviation yeah and um, what did you think of it? I laughed out loud. Because I, I literally went and bought it straight, <laughs> straight away because yeah. I loved Early Morning Riser so much. I didn't know about Early Morning Riser, so I've just read Standard Deviation. I read it recommended by my daughter and she said to me, I keep laughing at this book so much that, my, you know, Adrian, who, who she's married to, keeps saying to me, what are you laughing? Why are you laughing like that? So it's hilarious. And I loved it. Um, she, it's just great writing. It's just it's, great. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, you know, when I was, I was talking to one of my colleagues, I'm still in touch with colleagues at Radio 4, and I said, how come I don't know about Catherine Heine? And and uh, my colleague said, standard deviation is brilliant. So, yeah, I'm really, really glad you liked it. I understand that the new one, Early Morning Riser, is perhaps not quite as funny. Um, I don't know whether you'd agree, Tricia, but I think she's a little bit like Anne Tyler, but perhaps a little bit more edgy. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, Anne Tyler's books sort of creep up on you. I, I, I've always been open mouthed to Anne Tyler books because you start reading them and they're so... Um, what's the word, I, almost pedestrian, you know, they're just so, it's just, this happens and you, you think, oh, this, and suddenly it, they grab you and you just, they're just brilliant books. And uh, no, Standard Deviation I got me quite quickly, I have to say. Um, uh, they have, I mean, in the story, it's a, it's a, it's told from the point of view of the, of the father, but they, the, the, about his wife, who's his second wife, and uh, the the child that they have is um, he he's he's on the spectrum, and I I can't remember how it's described, but he he he's very into origami, um, which tells you a lot about him. He's a ten year old child, and and not ordinary origami. I mean, every, origami, you know, it, it, in a way that you and I wouldn't even begin to to understand. And I you know I have a special needs grand child so I think when you have a special child in your family who is different you know that that's the point this is the standard deviation thing um then you notice and are aware of all sorts of things that you aren't normally aware of nor do you notice because I often see India with um other other non-standard children and I mean that in the nicest possible way you know these children are special for a reason and uh, and it's fascinating it's fascinating so I it's a it's a it's a great book and I do recommend it absolutely um, uh, and now I'm going to come to you Emily and just uh, ask ask for any questions that you have so we just have one question which was from June she asked do you ever listen to audiobooks Dimpna and are there any awards for audiobooks I don't think there are awards for audiobooks. Um, no, I don't think there are. And the answer to the question is yes, I absolutely do listen to audiobooks. And um, when I was producing Book Club, because um, we were always focusing on a book that had been an earlier success, because my day job has been so sedentary. Um, you know, working from home, laptops, uh, I increasingly would mix my reading with going for a walk and listening to the book on audiobook if it was available, um, so that I, I'm just not continually sitting down, which as we all know is so bad for us. Um, and um, over the years with my kids, and um, maybe others have done this as well, um, I've lis we've listened to audiobooks in the car on holidays. I think my kids were just at the age where iPads hadn't been invented and they weren't kind of in the back 
wanting to do their own things. And we realised that if we listened to anything that was read by Martin Jarvis, the kids would be interested. Um, anything read by David Tennant as well, he's absolutely brilliant as an audiobook reader, as is Kenneth Branagh. Um, and in fact, my husband and I, we've um, continued this and we've got a camper van, we go camping and we listen to audiobooks um, on the journey and then at night time sitting up in bed and we have just finished Travels with My Aunt by Graham Greene, read by Tim Piggott Smith and it's brilliant. Um, and I see absolutely no difference between reading a book and listening to it. If someone says to me, have you read Travels with My Aunt? I will say, yes, I have because I, I heard it very, very plainly. Yeah. I've got a question actually. Um, have, you, have you ever been put off by an audiobook because of the person that's reading it? Because sometimes I struggle with that a little bit. Um, yes, I have, and I can't remember. Um, yeah, I absolutely definitely have, and I can't remember who it was. Um, but, um, Really interestingly, going back to Hilary Mantel, um, you know, on the TV adaptation, uh, Anton Lesser played, um, he didn't play, he didn't uh, play Cromwell, he played Thomas More in the TV adaptation. And when Radio 4, when my colleagues in the books team on Radio 4 did the Radio 4 adaptation of the three books, Anton Lesser read them and they were brilliant. And Ben Miles read the audio book. And I don't think I'm speaking out of turn to say that, you know, this is on Audible, he, that was the one that the publishers, um, the actor that the publishers booked. And the reviews of his reading on Audible are like, he's completely spoiled the books for us. <laughs> mm, uh, it's yeah. a, it's, that is a really good point, um, that the person, re uh, the quality, you need a good actor, don't you, to read, yeah. to read yeah. books really well. Um, I, I, every year for the last 20 years, when I've driven down to France, so that's a 12 hour journey, I listen, I, I, I've um, always bought um, cassette tapes, um, you know, to, to shove in my car. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, to the extent, and it's a very long journey, and I'm always dying to get there, but if I'm towards the end of a book and I'm getting very near the end of the journey, but I know that I'm going to get to, get to my destination before the book finishes, I slow down. <laughs> I want to hear the end of the book and the pleasure that I get of combining those two things is in yeah. I, I really we, really really um, I think we first got into them with um, the Harry Potters with Stephen Fry reading the Harry Potters which he does amazingly however they're not abridged and those books got longer and longer didn't they and you know and they were, were some of the first they were on CD they were so expensive they were 70 pounds each, and this is kind of 15 years ago. Um, so we used to get them out of the library ahead of the summer holidays. Yeah, <laughs> yes, for free. Um, well, in my breakout group, somebody, I don't know if this would be of interest quickly, but somebody asked me, what does a producer do? Because I kind of realized that sometimes I just completely forget to kind of explain what a producer does. And would that be of interest okay. if I, repeat that. Um, so we're basically behind the scenes from the person who's in front of the mic. So on Book Club, working with Jim Nocte, um, we were a very small team. It was me, Jim, and um, my editor. So if you think about a newspaper having an editor and me being like a reporter, uh, she was my manager. And the three of us would get together every six months and we would choose a range of authors who had not been on before um, and uh, kind of choose to invite them. I was the one who invited them and then uh, booked them in, booked the recording space at the BBC, booked the sound engineers, um, and then ordered the books in, all the practical stuff, posted the books to Jim, read the book or listened to it on audio book, 
wrote briefing notes for Jim. So, I mean, he would read the book, obviously, but I would kind of write almost like an essay um, with themes for discussion that, so that he would know what were the salient points of each book that we needed to talk about. And then we would um, get together on the morning of the recording and talk it all through. Meantime, I had been booking all our readers. And I do want to say if anybody would like to take part in the book club, it's very easy. Just go to the book club website, you know, Google BBC Radio 4 book club and there's a form there. Um, and I liaised with all the readers, uh, booking them in, asking them for questions and then telling them which questions we wanted to hear from them. Uh, creating waiting lists when people dropped out, going to the waiting list and then sending people their joining instructions. I mean, it's absolutely the whole shebang. Uh, recording on the day, going away with 45 minutes of audio with all the retakes and the stopping and starting um, and taking that home on a laptop and editing the programme at home. So I have digital audio editing skills, editing it down to 28 minutes for broadcast and then going back to a sound engineer in the BBC who smoothed it all over, um, made the sound levels nice. My editor would hear it before transmission and then we would schedule it for broadcast. And then I also had to write all the text for the website, get photos from the publishers. Um, so, you know, was publishing. Oh, and the podcast as well. Used to publish the podcast. So, yeah. That was everything actually, yeah. didn't <laughs> You did it all. <laughs> Stop. Yes. And I was just saying in my breakout group, I'm sure my colleagues wouldn't remind, wouldn't mind me saying this, um, but they've asked me to go back next month and cover for holiday. They said, um, oh, do you know, we were thinking of booking a freelancer and we just thought, well, maybe you'd just like to come back. So it does feel ridiculous. I had this great goodbye and, uh, you know, and now I'm going back for a month in August. And do you know which <laughs> book and author you're going to... Well, actually, it hasn't been confirmed yet, so I can't quite say. But um, if anyone wants to know, uh, you know, I can let you know, Tricia. <laughs> some, we're hoping to go for somebody quite nice, a nice kind of light summer read. But um, the invite only went out a couple of days ago, so I can't say. So not confirmed yet. Yeah. Um, did you have another question there, Emily? Yeah, we've just got a few more through. Um, Alison asked, do you have a favourite genre of author? Um, I just love those family stories uh, written by women. I think it's kind of just my age, really. But um, my favourite author is Barbara Pym. She absolutely is my favourite author. And if you don't know her, um, she was writing in the 50s or even just straight after the war. And she writes, I mean, she's dead now, but she wrote um, comic novels, kind of very gently comic um, about women's lives. Quite often her main character, they're a little bit heartbroken. They've had unrequited love or they might be in, in unhappy marriages. They fall in love with the wrong person normally. Um, she was quite involved in the Church of England and there's quite often... Uh, churches and church jumble sales involved and curates and you know women falling in love with curates and um, I think she wrote about 15 books and I've read them all and they are definitely my go-to book there was a biography of her came out in March which caused quite a stir um, because it was just very honest about her life and she'd had a boyfriend in um Germany in the 1930s who was a Nazi he was in the SS and she just kind of refused to see what was going on in Germany she was just quite blinkered and um but actually that's just not put me off her in the books because um I just think she was just being a bit thick really about that at the time and I just love the book so much so I've, I've, I've got all her on the shelf I love Persephone books as well um, which is the publishing house that is now based in Bath and they republish uh, women writers from the 19th, 20th, mid 20th century, early, 
early 20th century have been a little bit overlooked. And there's some great writers there, great stories that they publish. <laughs> That was absolutely br brilliant, Diffner. I think um, Alison just uh, put some comment at the bottom, like I could listen to this for hours. And uh, I feel the same way because it's just so interesting. And uh, well, I love books as much as you do. So uh, talking about books, talking about authors and talking about that whole process of, uh, you know, of writing and what it means to us is, uh, well, it's absolutely, I, I just love it. I really love it. So thank you so much. You've Not been at all. It was my pleasure. Guest, and I really enjoyed talking to you and thank you to everybody who's come along this afternoon to listen. Um, this will also be on YouTube actually, uh, but um, you know we'll have lots of people will, will enjoy it when, uh, when they see it on, on YouTube. So thank you, good luck as the judge of Costa, you're going to be very busy and um, as I said thank you for coming this afternoon to talk to all of us. Bye bye everybody, bye bye.